we've been uh, in our cabins. Most of us who have a job was in our cabins Monday to Friday, probably Monday to Saturday, maybe six days or five days before looking at screen or some files. But today we are in the church uh, with brothers and sisters redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And a smile is the best thing you can offer to each other now. Uh, because you have been with uh, Gramby people, uh, Gramby bosses, and all that. But now we are with people who are so relaxed, I think. I would say I am because Jesus takes care of all our cares and all our burdens are upon him. Yesterday I pinged to the core group saying that today's sermon is based on John chapter 6 verses 1 to 71. Read it before you come to church. The reason was simple. The reason was, is there a Hindi translation going on? Who is doing that? Um, please. Um, the reason is, there is 71 verses. You can't read that 71 verses in the, in the church. It could take a lot of time. Now, let me ask you, how many of you really read it? Hands up. I see only two people. Yes. Oh, praise God. More people. Yes. But I see a lot of face heads going down. And I don't know what, what does that mean. Now, <clears throat> before I come to the passage, we had a wonderful lady in our church. I mean, many of you may not know her because she seldom came to church, but she visited us on uh, weekends or during the weeks and all that. So most of you may not, may not have met her. Some of you may. And she was a very beautiful uh, girl, more than beauty, very lovable girl. You know, she, though she was 23 years old, she used to hang on my hand and walk around and uh, we used to take her for shopping and all that. And um, people would think that uh, she is a little baby. And uh, when we put her on a bus to go back to her hostel, she will put all her baggage in and just come down and say, wait, auntie, uncle, and then give us a tight hug and all that. And speaks very sweetly. You know, she was a chatterbox. She doesn't need any topic at all. She can talk about like our MPs in the Lok Sabha on all irrele irrelevant things in a beautiful way. Wonderful girl. But there's a saying that beauty and brain doesn't go together, isn't it? And uh, she is a girl who's very, very poor in logical reasoning. Logical reasoning. One day, she was traveling towards us from Mahabaleshwar. So I was a little worried because she's going to land here in Swargate at after, in the evening, late in the evening. So I told her as a precaution that before she lands there, we should be there to pick her up so that she will not be uh, left alone in the Swargate, Swargate West Stand. So I told her, uh, as soon as you enter Pune town, you call us so that we will come to Swargate so that when, but before your bus comes, we'll be there to pick you. So it's usually Mahabaleshwar to Pune takes two and a half hours minimum. But after an hour, before an hour, I would say, we get a, I got a call, uncle, I am in Pune. So I took my car keys and both of us rushed to Swargate and no bus. We waited another hour for her in Swargate, just in that polluted bus stand. And then she comes with her wide, sweet smile to hug. I asked her, what happened? So what happened is, after an hour's journey, she saw a sign saying Pune. But it also said Pune, 100 kilometers. But she didn't read that. <laughs> she only read Pune and called me, Uncle, I am in Pune. And that is. That's many times, you know. I mean, so what happened? What went wrong? She saw sign, the sign to Pune, but she thought the sign is the place she wants to go. 
That's where things went wrong. That sign is not Pune. That sign simply says you are traveling towards Pune. Praise God, she didn't get down there. <laughs> now, this is what one important aspect of faith is. What is faith? Now, we are looking at what we call now, this is the third or fourth sermon on this, the signs in the book of John. The signs in the book of John. These are the miracles reported in other Gospels. Healing people, uh, 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 casting out demons and uh, multiplying bread. All these are reported in other Gospels. But John says, the last writer, Gospel writer says, all these miracles are signs. All these miracles are signs, S-I-G-N-S. What does that mean? These miracles have meaning. But the miracles themselves are not the meaning. These miracles that Jesus did are leading or pointing towards a greater meaning. That's what he is talking about. Everything. So, what is the failure of Christian faith? Faith fails when we are like my dear little adopted daughter. When we settle with the signs and refuses to go beyond the signs to the real meaning that the signs are pointing out. Now, in this book, in this passage, this has, if you read it faithfully, has actually two main parts. One is, two main parts. One is <coughs> chapter 6, verses 1 to 14, where we have this story that is also reported in other Gospels, of multiplying bread. Jesus sees, Jesus saw this big, huge multitude of people, 6,000 men, which probably means, probably means 18,000 people. Men may have their wives also with them, or usually in any <laughs> gathering like here also, women outnumber men. So and there may be children, there was definitely one child there, and uh, there were many other children as well who came to Jesus or hear Jesus. And there are probably, we can estimate, about 18,000 people. And 18,000 people, Jesus says, we have to give them bread. So Philip and Andrew and all those people threw up their head, hands and said, where do we go for food for these people? Where do we go for food? No, a crisis sometimes we also face. We buy food for 60 people and 80 people turn out. Where do we go for food? I, sometimes I think, I hope I can multiply food sometimes. But nowadays, I have given the food department to somebody else. So it just becomes their problem now. Now, 6, 1 to 14 is about Jesus multiplying from five uh, loaves of, and two fish. He multiplies it so that they ate their fill. And there, there were 12 baskets full. But then, after a brief incident of walking on water, in the chapter, sixth chapter, verse 22 to the end of it, Jesus explains what is the meaning of all this. He just goes on to explain. There's a discourse. He goes to explain what is the meaning of all this. Now, that is, that is what the summary of the chapter. Here, we see a clash between, in this book, we see a clash between real faith and fake faith. We all believe that God can heal our sickness. I believe, and I am experiencing it as well. God heals our <coughs> sickness. God provides when we have lack. That, that is something that we all Belief, but we are able to believe whatever, whatever we are comfortable to believe. Let me say that put it. We are always see. Take this uh, fact. Now the, there are people who do not believe in God, and there are people who believe in God. How many percentage doesn't believe in God? All. 
throughout the history of the world, they were always a minority. That means majority believe in some God, one God or other. Majority believes in some God, in some form, somewhere. Everybody believes. Faith is not that difficult. Faith is not that difficult. Anyone can believe in God. Anyone can believe in a guru. Anyone can believe in a miracle. Anyone can believe in divine powers. There's no problem. But that is something that we find. But there is another faith. That faith is something that God reveals on his own terms. I can actually take a stone, put it on this table, and put a garland, and I can worship. I can light a candle. I can uh, light an um, uh, incense stick. I can make my own God, and it is because that God is a God in my own terms. That's fine. But when God reveals himself and says, I am the real God, then it becomes difficult for us because that God demands, has his own terms, his own conditions, his own ways. It is not a human invention. It is God revealing himself. See, this is the crisis of faith. This is the crisis of faith. Now, there's a poet in, in Malayalam. He's, a very, he's, he's famous for short, 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 short poems. He said, God created man on the sixth day and on the seventh day, man turned against God and created God. People invented religions. People invented religions. On the sixth day, God created man. And he says, on the seventh day, man created his own God. That explains why there are religions in this world. It is easy. But now the crisis is, I'll come to the crisis. Here in this passage, we can see a clash of faith. We can see a clash of faith. Where is the clash of faith? Now, second part. Now, <clears throat> this passage, John chapter 6, 6, John chapter 6, 1 to 71, begins with a scene. Scene of multitude of people walking towards Jesus. Multitude of people. You can see them from a distance. I've been to that place. Man, which is supposed to be around that place at least. And you can see, when Jesus was sitting there, I'm not reading the passage, I, I hope you have read it. When Jesus was sitting on that, um, whatever, uh, uh, what you can call, the lawn or whatever place he was sitting, the grassy place, he saw a lot of people following, coming to see him. They were walking towards him. And then, not only that, when Jesus provided food for them, multiplied food for them, they, was, they were so much impressed, so impressed, so they wanted to make him king. That is verse 15 of the same verse. He was, they wanted to make him king. And then, then after a while, if you go to the third part of this book, that is 622 to 71, the same people who ate the bread crossed the sea the lake actually, he, they crossed the sea and followed Jesus to Capernaum. Why? Why did they go? Because they ate the bread, they saw the miracles, so they were able to, they were willing to take a perilous journey across the sea to follow Jesus. And Jesus said, you are following me because you ate bread. Now, that is how, that is one movement in this story in these stories, one moment, people will do anything to follow Jesus. They will do anything to follow Jesus. But that is not the story. There's another moment. When you come to chapter 6, verse 66, when we come to chapter 6, 66, this is the longest chapter, one of the longest chapter in the New Testament. Maybe the longest, I'm not sure. I think this is the longest chapter in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels. And towards the end of it, in chapter 6, verse 66, when Jesus, see, after this, many of his disciples 
turned back and no longer walked with him. Many left as well. So you see the movement here? Here is a huge crowd. Huge crowd following Jesus even across the sea. Now when Jesus explained the sign, the miracle, what is the miracle? What is the real bread? You ate bread, but what is the real bread? When the meaning was explained to them, they said, no, we don't want to take that. We don't believe in Jesus. We don't want to believe in Jesus. Because that is not what we want. Jesus said, what you ate is the material, physical bread that I multiplied. Okay? It comes from a boy's basket, tiffin box. It has come from his mother's oven. His mother might have baked it. And I have multiplied it. It is a bread that you eat and that you excrete and that's it. Within three hours time, you need other, another serving of bread. But what you are saying, what you see is a sign, the sign, road sign saying Pune. But that is not Pune. What you now see by eating, eating the food, eating this bread, is simply a sign saying, a road sign saying, you are traveling towards Pune, but it is not Pune. It is bread, but it is not the living bread. There is some other reality. There is another reality. There are two things. One is bread for life, and the other is bread of life. The world cannot understand that. That is the blindness of the world. There is a bread which we all eat. It comes in different forms. It can come as a sandwich or a burger or it can come in the form of a chapati. It can be flat or round or long. It may have garlic in it or without garlic in it. It may be eggless or without egg. But that is the bread we eat for life. But in this world there is another reality and that is a God-given reality. That is a reality that has come from God, that is revealed to humanity through Jesus Christ. And that is the bread of life. Distinguish these two. Bread for our living. We need them every three hours or four hours. And there is something called bread of life. The bread that gives life. Now when Jesus explained that... He is the bread of life. The life-giving bread. People said, no, we don't want that. So many of his disciples, and that includes the people who ate the bread the previous night, the real bread the previous night, they left. They left as well. Now, here is the problem. I've been preaching that again and again and again and again. There's only one theme for all these seven sermons that I'm going to preach. Maybe the sixth next Sunday. That is, where does your faith lay? Where is your faith founded? On miracles? Or something which is more than miracles? I visited an, a person yesterday, a dear friend of mine, and we prayed together. And that's why I visited him. Um, so, he operates in a different level. I operate in a different level. But our friendship has no problem. He sees God in miracles, and sometimes I think he sees God only in miracles. Anyway, I also believe in miracles, but slightly different approach, but we are very strongly bonded spiritual brothers. I prayed with him yesterday, visited him and had a coffee with him and then uh, he was talking to me miracles after miracles after miracles that happened. My God. Uh, some miracle in some other place and one miracle is that uh, he prayed over a person who had kidney stones uh, and uh, then he prayed over him and he went to the toilet and uh, one stone came out. So this man who received the miracle decided uh, something and he took a mug and peed into the mug. And he peed into the mug and after that they counted 
how many stones? 16 stones came out. So keep your mug ready, okay, always, when you go to get over, prayed over. KDM mug also. So, wonderful miracle, right? Wonderful miracle. I believe that really happened. I have no question about it. Because I know my brother, the one who prayed. I know he's trustworthy. He will never lie to me. Even if he lies to his wife, he will not lie to me. He knows what will happen. So, I believe him fully. But now my question, my honest question is, after the 17th stone coming through your pee, what next? What next would be Jesus as your savior? That must be the 17th stone. If that doesn't happen, nothing has happened. If that doesn't happen, nothing has happened. And if that doesn't happen, all that happened is useless. Beyond the sign, the miracle, you ate bread. You want him to make him king. And you are looking for him. You had your supper on the other side of the sea. And the morning you are searching him for bread, breakfast. He may give, and he may also give, provide lunch. That is not the crowd that Jesus wants around him. That they may believe. Now I want to reinforce it again, which I have said last Sunday also. We need to have miracles in our lives. That is a display of God's abundant grace. We don't deserve it. That is the display of God's immense power to help us, to save us, because he has the whole world in his control. He can walk over the water, he can multiply food, he can heal the leper, he can cast out the fears from you, your demons from you, he can do everything. He is gracious and he is powerful. That's one thing. But moving beyond that to a saving grace is the ultimate goal of life. That is why it's difficult. This chapter also talks about how difficult it is to believe in Jesus, the Savior. Now, let me also move on to say the two breads that Jesus is talking about. The two bread that Jesus is talking about. Somehow, this <coughs> service has some spiritual unity today. Regida started with the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. I, I recommend that we memorize, learn it by heart, the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and things like that. That they are very, very valuable. What does the Lord's Prayer say? Give us our daily bread. And that bread is, Jesus is talking about the real bread. He's talking about the real bread. Give us our daily bread. It is not saying, give us our bread daily. That is not the point. The point is, that is, that is assured. Our bread will be given daily. Many of us don't want that. We want today's bread and tomorrow's bread and also for bread for many years to come. Okay. But that is different. It is guaranteed. What is guaranteed? Your daily bread is guaranteed. That is called the common grace. God is a just and loving God. Read Psalm 104. Meditate on it. For he rains, he showers rain, he brings the rain upon the wicked and the righteous. See, God will not position the clouds in such a way it rains in the Christian America and it will not rain on the Muslim Pakistan. God is not like such a God. Our God definitely is not. The God I serve is not. No, America is not Christian, by the way. That's another story. Now, what I'm saying is, where God's people live, okay, some people think Israel is the people of God even now. Okay, let's think that way. God will rain on Israelites, the people of the nation of Israel, and God will withdraw rain from the Palestinians. No. God loves everybody. But equally, he distributes everything, air to everybody equally. But there are poverty. 
there is uh, deprivation in the world. All that is created by human beings. Now, many of the rich countries, sorry, poor countries are really rich. You know that? Many of the richest countries, sorry, poorest countries are the richest countries, wealthiest countries, I should rather say that way. Because they have diamonds, they have oil, they have everything, but it is exploited by a few people and pushing majority into poverty. And God has no part in that. This is a human created crisis. God is not responsible for that. You understand what I'm saying? So God provides that. But there is, so what happens is, the word, the 627 says, the chapter 6 verse 27 says, okay, quickly, it says that many of, 627, Sahil, Yes, 627 says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on whom God has set his seal. There is a food that perishes, and a food that we need to toil for. That is why we go. Though we come to church at 11 o'clock, though the services starts at 10, 15, we go to work at 9 if it is 10. The real login time is 10. We report at 9 o'clock, honestly, don't, don't we? Why? We want to make sure our bread comes, is assured. We toil for that. We will stay, as long as the boss is in the cabin, we will stay in our cabin. Why? We are toiling for the food that perishes. That's the reason. There's no other motivation. We will only leave after he left, after we hear his car revving up. Why? Because we are so careful that our bread is secure. But there is another bread. But this bread, all this toil, is, Jesus says, this bread reminds us of something else. Though the time is, I don't have much time, I just want to tell you a story. I mean, no, uh, some insight that I received last week. That everything in life, we can see as spiritual significance. I shared it on Thursday with some of you, about 10 of you who came for the study. I extended it to my own life. That is simple as this. Let me just quickly go through it. Every day when we get up, it reminds us of a spiritual reality. When we go to bed and when we get up, when we go to bed, we realize a spiritual reality. One day we'll all sleep the sleep of death. But when we get up from the bed in the morning, whatever time it is, it also reminds us, one day we will get up from our sleep of death to eternal life with a glorified body. Karl Barth, a famous celebrated theologian said, that is something that we should live by. Every day when we get up, we should think of the great resurrection that we will receive even after we die. That's what the Bible says. But we realize another thing. Today I am getting up to get tired and needing sleep again, to sleep and refresh. But that is not what is going to happen. This. I try to extend this a little bit more. One way, every time I'm conscious of, of my own breath, inhale, exhale. Every time I'm conscious of my breath, I should also realize it's another way of worshiping God, to be conscious of Him. You know, to glorify him, to enjoy him forever, to be conscious of his presence, is to remind that I breathe because God breathed into my nose. Praise God. And I'm just suggesting some ways of living close to God. Is seeing spiritual significance in our daily mundane activities. The Bible says, God breathed into the nostrils of Adam, and he became a living being. And Psalm 104 says, you take the breath from their nostrils and they return to dust. You see that reality. Every time we, we uh, eat bread, whatever form it is, chapatis or puris or whatever it is, it should remind us, this is not the real bread. This is the bread, there's another bread, and that is my portion now. Jesus, the bread of life. Praise God. What a wonderful experience. Jesus says, I am the bread of 
life. What you just ate yesterday evening for dinner is a bread that perishes. You can't keep it for more than, a, more than two days. It is useless, but it will make you hungry again. In the previous chapter, in chapter 4, in his discourse with the Samaritan woman over the water, he said, this water you drink will make you thirsty again. But the water I give will work towards eternal life, a spiritual reality. Now, Jesus said something. That is true, to believe in Jesus. Jesus is the true bread. But he said something which they found very horrible. He said, eat of it and not die. Now, let me read it. 650 to 51. It will come on your screen. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and do not die. I am the living bread, or bread of life, that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Oh, this is very difficult to understand. That is why the many people left. What Jesus said is, now you ate this bread, now I am the bread of life. You eat of me. If you, anyone eat, eats of this bread, he will live forever. Now, towards his death, the night before he was uh, betrayed, arrested, Jesus instituted what we call the communion table. And he said, taking the bread, he said, this is the bread that is broken for you. Eat of it. And he said, took the wine as a symbol, and he said, this is the cup of the, uh, uh, my blood in the new, the, the, of the new covenant. Drink of it. Now, this is symbolism in the church, Christian church. What is that? That is to say that Christ died for me so that I will have eternal life. Christ died for me so that I will have eternal life. What is happening at the communion table? We believe that Christ died for us. But when we partake in the communion table, or the table of the Lord, which is right on the table, which is before us now, and we are going to participate in it soon, very soon, what happens is that we accept the death of Christ and say, this is, we accept it in faith. This is a proclamation. This is a declaration that Christ died for me. You take the death of Christ from Christianity, the biblical religion, then it becomes Islam. Simple as that. See, our Muslim brothers believe everything we believe. Our Muslim brothers believe in Abraham, the, in, 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 the Nabi Abraham. They believe in uh, all the prophets. They also believe in Jesus Christ. They also believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. They believe. But they don't believe one thing, that Jesus died. Our Hindu brothers have no problem. Now, how many places you have seen along in the array of gods, Jesus has a very central place. They adore Jesus. Nothing wrong. But what is the difference? The difference is to say, Jesus is the bread sent from God, and I accept that in faith. His death. He died for me. When I say that, then only eternal life becomes our portion. It becomes the reality. It becomes a reality for us. Now, the little village church I grew up, I have nostalgic memories of that little village congregation. It was a healthy bringing up, I would say. One of the songs that we sang in the communion was a very meaningful communion. We all knelt down when the minister prayed over the bread and the wine and brought it to us. We will all kneel down and accept it. At the same time, some of us, all of us will be singing a song. There are many songs, but one song is so meaningful. It says, I believe, it's a very simple song, I believe that Jesus 
died for me. I believe there are many stanzas, but two lines that I remember. I believe that Jesus shed his blood to take sin away from me. And we kneel down and we accept the bread and wine in faith. Not only in faith, proclaiming our faith. What is the proclamation? The proclamation is simple, that Jesus died for me. Jesus shed his blood to take sin away from me. So we all kneel down and take it. That is what is happening here. We proclaim, we proclaim as, as believers in Jesus Christ, we proclaim that Jesus died for me and I accept his death in faith. And what is going to happen in the communion is, it's a symbolism. People who have said that, people who have believed that, they again and again renew their faith in Jesus' death for the forgiveness of my sins which made me whole and the child of God. That's what the whole thing is about. Now why did Jesus, John write this? John wrote this book, he says, and I have many passages I can read, but I'll just submit myself to one. Chapter 20, verses 30 to 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, the two breads. Jesus did many such signs, but I don't have space to record everything. That's what John says. It will require quite a lot of scrolls to write every miracle that he did, signs he did, but which are not written in this book. These are written, I have selected, I have made a short selection, a brief selection of miracles or signs that Jesus did so that you may believe that Jesus is Christ. You may believe. Jesus is the Messiah sent by God, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Not a life, this is what I was saying. Death is not the end of life. Death is the beginning of a new life. That is what the Bible says. Death is not the end of life. Death is the beginning of a new life. It is not the beginning of an inferior life as a reincarnation. It is not the beginning of a, another life, a reincarnation, which can be inferior or superior. But this is life at a new level, in a new realm, with God and forever. And the way to that is Jesus Christ, accepting that he died for us. And for us, he gave his life so that we have eternal life. Now, there are two ways of accepting it. One is a private response. That is what we call, you are saved or not. Accepting this as a private event. I confess my sins and accept Jesus as, a, as the Lord into my life and give him the full control. That happens between you and the God. It's between you and Jesus Christ. But after that, there is another confession. And you say, you take a stand for God. That is a public confession. You say, I no more belong to this world. I no more belong to devil. I don't no more belong to the sin. I have accepted Jesus, and I want to say that in public. That's a public confession, which we call baptism or joining with the Lord. So now, that is how these two aspects of our life, a private confession and forgiveness, a public confession, and declaring that we belong solely to God. Our ownership of our life is given to God. Now that is what we declare in the communion. I'm moving to the communion now. What happens is that we realize the relative value of this. The daily bread that we eat, 
and the eternal life that God offers. And there is only one way to the eternal life, and that is through faith in Jesus Christ. I just want to give a minute to those who would like to make a decision in these two regards. Would you move? Let me appeal to you. Let's close our eyes. Will you move towards Jesus from miracles, from the daily life, sustenance of life? Would you say that the only thing that you have to say that, as I said, as I already cited that song, just believe that Jesus died for me and he shed his blood for the remission of my sins. If you would just say that, Jesus, I am a sinner, I need your grace, I confess my sins, and I accept you as my Lord and Savior. That's all that you need to do. And Jesus comes to your heart and takes control. And now, again you say, I will declare this faith in public before my brothers and sisters in water baptism, saying that I am died, I am dead, in, de dead and I am risen to new life. I was once dead in my sins, but now I am a new creation in Christ. And doing that act in faith. If you would like to say this prayer of the sinner, you're welcome to do that as I say that and repeat after me. But if you take a decision, having done that, if you take a decision to move into water baptism, I encourage you to do that and see me later. Maybe next Sunday we will have a sermon, uh, we'll have a baptism service. And if you are ready for it, please let me know or Nobi, so we can make arrangements for it. Will you close your eyes and examine your hearts? If you haven't received Jesus as your Savior yet, will you do that now? Just simply pray with me these prayer words simply and Jesus will definitely will come into your heart and then you are saved. If you are guided by the Spirit of God, please pray with me. Lord, I am a sinner. I need you and I confess my sins. I believe that you have died, you have died for me and you are able to save me. I put my trust in thee, O Lord. I receive you as my Savior and the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's move to the, the Lord's table.